Thank you, Chuck. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 9. We are going to cover a little bit more ground than we've been covering lately. But we're going to begin with verse 50, 49, rather. And I'm going to read till the end of the chapter. This is from God's uh, holy word. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, oh, I'm sorry, verse 49, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word and you have given it to us. We need to hear from it. We need to hear from your spirit. We pray that you would help us and guide us in all things, that we would see Christ and desire to follow him more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. This section actually begins a rather uh, long, longer, a much longer section in the Gospel of Luke, is sometimes called the travel narrative. Uh, and it actually begins with verse 51, um, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So they're on their way to Jerusalem, and they finally get there when you get to Luke chapter 19, verse 45. So this is like 10 chapters later, they finally get there. But along the way, uh, Jesus is instructing them. Jesus is teaching them. There are other instances as well. He's sending out 72, and, and maybe Luke has arranged the story a little bit, uh, puts stories in a little bit different order. But the, but the point is, they are on their way to Jerusalem, and it is on the way that Jesus begins to teach them and instruct them and remind them and tell them all that who he is and what he's going to do and what he wants them to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, a poetic analogy to uh, learning along the road. Um, you know, along the road of life, along the path of life is where we learn our lessons. And this is, this is a really true thing, especially with Jesus and the disciples. The Jesus is literally living with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it is as they travel that they are learning and that they are growing and they are maturing. There will be a lot, a, a lot of the parables of Jesus will be in this section of Luke. Before we saw a lot of the miracles, now we're gonna see in this uh, second section of Luke a lot of parables. But even in this section that we read this morning, there were three lessons that come to mind that Jesus is teaching them as they're on the way uh, to Jerusalem. And the first lesson has to deal with who is most important. Who is most important? And ultimately, this is going to result in the disciples learning the lesson, hopefully learning the lesson of true humility. Now, it, be, it begins in verse uh, 49. John says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. But it's actually the continuation of that passage that we looked at last week, that Titus uh, led us in last week, where in, in verses 46 uh, to 48, there's a discussion amongst the disciples about who is the greatest. 
And in the midst of that discussion, Jesus takes a child in verse 48, and he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Um, Jesus makes an interesting point there. The one who is least is the greatest. And why is the one who is least the greatest? Because the, who is the greatest among us? The greatest amongst the disciples is not the disciples. It's actually Jesus. And yet Jesus is the one who came in humility. Jesus is the one who comes in meekness. Jesus is the one who comes in gentleness. And so if you want to be great, you have to be like Jesus. That's essentially what's going on here. So he takes a little child, he illustrates it, and he says there, um, whoever receives um, this child in my name, and notice the language there, receives this child in my name, receives me. And so Jesus is saying, uh, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be as meek and humble as it were, even like a child. Why? Because that's the way Jesus is because that child models my character, my nature. In other words, the focus is not on the disciples. The focus is not even on the little child. The focus is on Jesus. You see what he's doing there. Now, when you get to verse 49 and 50, there's actually a practical application to this. The disciples come across a man who is casting out demons but he is casting out these demons in the name of Jesus. He's casting out demons in your name, it says in verse 49. And we tried to stop him. And so Jesus is going to teach, use this occasion to teach them what it means when Jesus said, I'm the most important one in here. Um, now notice what he does. He says he is casting out demons in your name. Remember, if anybody ex receives a little child in my name, if anyone is now, the, the, he's, the man is casting out demons in your name, and Jesus says the important thing is not what group the man is associated with. Remember, the disciples say, well, he's not one of us. He's not one of the 12. He's not one of these people that was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's not one of these people that have walked with you for these past two years or so like we've walked with you. He's not in the important group. And Jesus says what group he's in is not important. What is important is, does he belong to me? Is he casting out demons in my name? Is he for me? Is he with me? Not is he with the right group, you see? What's most important? Is the most important thing what group you're in? Is the most important thing what people you associate with? Or is the most important thing do you associate with Jesus? That's, that's what's going on here. And ultimately, he's trying to teach them about humility. He's trying to teach them not to think that they're really, really important, that their group is the most important thing, that their associations are most important. He's trying to teach them that he the Lord Jesus is the most important thing. You know, oftentimes I think about what do I need to do to be humble? You know, what, how, how, do I, how do I build humility in my character? And I typically think the way that I build humility in my character is I, you know, I just, I, I beat myself up. I tell myself what a lousy sinner I am. Uh, I, I, you know, I think of all of these things I do wrong. I think of all this problem that I have and this. And it's all true. I have all of those things. But that's not how you build humility in your character. The way you build humility in your character as a Christian is to look to the ultimate humble one, to look to the one who is most important. We actually build humility by looking to Jesus and say, how can I be like that? If Jesus is the most important person in my life, if he's the most important thing, humility is gonna come not from me beating myself up, but from me looking to him, saying, how can I mirror him? How can I be like him? How can I have the attitude of Christ, who though he was God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of men, he humbled himself and became obedient, even obedience to the death of the cross. 
Jesus is the greatest among us, but he is also the servant of us all. So if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to be great the way he is great, we must be like a servant. Now, so the question is this, do, how much do I want to be like Jesus? If I want to be like Jesus, then I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to care more about other people than I'm going to care about myself. I'm not going to find my pride or my arrogance in what group I'm with, what church I belong to, what, my, what, what spiritual gifts I have, or any of those things. I'm going to find my identity in belonging to Jesus himself. Do you want to be like Jesus or not? If I don't want to be like Jesus, then I'm against him. Jesus actually says that in Luke 11, 23. He says, he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There are people that are against Jesus, but this man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name was not one of them. And that's what the disciples miss. Do I want to be like Jesus? If I don't, then I'm against him. But if I do, then I'm going to be, then my response to others will be one of grace and compassion and humility because that's the way Jesus is like. So the first lesson along the road is who is most important? Is Jesus the most important person? Is he is the most important thing in your life? And if he is, then you're going to treat other people with the humility that he himself exhibited. But here's the second question along the road. And this happens in verses 51 to 56. And this lesson that's going to be learned is the lesson I call of God's forbearance. The lesson of forbearance. And ultimately, this is going to translate into a lesson of compassion for the disciples. If you look at verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, this is where the journey technically begins in the scriptures in verse 51. But notice uh, the, the days drew near for him to be taken up. Most, um, most interpreters, most commentators identify that taken up as taken up into heaven, the ascension, the final part of of his uh, ministry on this earth where he ascended into heaven. Other people see it as he's, he's going up to Jerusalem, but typically when you see that language, it's a reference to the end of his earthly ministry, the very last thing that happens to him. So basically what Luke's saying is we are beginning our march toward the cross to Jerusalem. At Jerusalem, Jesus is going to die when he's going to rise from the grave, and then at the end, he's going to, 40 days later, he's going to ascend to the right hand of God the Father, and there he will reign uh, until he comes again. So we are headed towards that point. And Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem, which is just fancy language of saying he is determined to get there. That is the singular focus on his mind now, is to get to Jerusalem, to go there. That's just just, just fancy language for saying it. By the way, it's Old Testament language. It comes from uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 50 and other, sort, other places where Isaiah the prophet is told to set his face towards this task or do that. Now, on the way to Jerusalem that he's determined to get to, he sends messengers ahead of him in verse uh, 52 to prepare the way in a particular village in Samaria. Galilee would be in the north. Jerusalem would be further south. They would need to go or typically you could go, would go through Samaria in order to get to Jerusalem, which would have been in the south. By the way, Jerusalem is on a hill, so oftentimes in the Bible you will see them talking about going up to Jerusalem, it, going up to Jerusalem, going up the hill because of the nature of the topographies, not, not because of north and south. But he's going up to Jerusalem, but he goes through Samaria first, and on his way through there, Verse 53, the people do not receive him, the Samaritans. And they don't receive him, why? Because his face was set toward Jerusalem, because of where he was going. Now, most of you probably know that the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. And their history is rather, rather long. The, the animosity that, that existed between these two groups had existed for hundreds of years. It had, on occasion, 
resulted in violence, acts of terrorism would go back and forth. Th these two groups, the Jews and the Samaritans, hated each other. And one of, their chief, one of the chief rivalries between them is where was the true temple of God? And the Samaritans said that the true temple, the true place of worship was not in Jerusalem. It was on a different mountain where God had spoken and a different mountain where God wanted. And it's a long history of how this happened. But the Jews and the Samaritans simply hated each other. So that when they find out that Jesus is going to Jerusalem and he happens to have the nerve to pass through their town on the way of Jerusalem, they basically insult him. They basically said, we're not going to give you hospitality. We're not going to treat you with respect. And, and it really is an indignity. It really is insulting. And so John and James in verse 54, by the way, it was also John in verse 49 that wanted to stop the, the man from casting out the demons. Here's John and J again and his brother James. And he said, Lord, uh, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's a, that's a good response to somebody who insults you, right? Yeah. Um, on the one hand, you, you can say positively, John and James, they do care about the integrity of their master. They are trying to defend him in some way. On the other hand, it seems a little bit extreme. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Now, they're actually taking this um, from um, uh, um, Elijah, who called down fire from heaven and consumed uh, 50 men who came to arrest him. So they're actually using Old Testament imagery here of, of an Old Testament incident that, that happens. Uh, it would be in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10, if you're interested in looking up the story. Elijah answered the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And that happens not once, it happens twice. And, and so James and John say, hey, this would be a good chance for us to exercise this, to see this again, see this happen in real time. Their motive is protecting Jesus' honor, but in so doing, their motive is also in protecting their own honor. Because you see, when you insult our master, you've insulted us too. And we don't like being insulted. We don't like the indignity of it. And so let's show us who you are. Let's call down fire from heaven and let God judge you here and now. And what's Jesus' response? Well, he rebukes James and John, verse 55. And then in verse 56, he simply moves on. No judgment. No woe on you, you city that have rejected the, the Messiah. Woe is you. None of that. There, there, there is some of that that comes later. It actually comes towards the cities in Galilee. Jesus will pronounce woe on cities that reject him. But interestingly enough, he doesn't do it in this city. Doesn't do it with these people. No judgment, no curse, no fire from heaven. Instead, he simply moves on. Now, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you a, a number of things. It, it, two things two things that come to mind to me that tells me right away. First of all, it tells me that the Messiah is merciful and that the wrath of God is actually going to come slowly, not quickly. Remember Exodus 34, 6, when God reveals himself to Moses, the Lord passed before him and proclaims the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I was slow to anger. Do you think about God as being slow to anger? That phrase, that verse, repeats itself throughout the Old Testament. In Joel 2, verse 13, rend your hearts, not your garments, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. We think that God is quick to bring judgment, that he's quick to bring disaster. He's quick to, to, to bring fire from heaven and consume us, and it is a good thing he is not, because none of us would be here if God was not slow to anger. Some of you are very, very slow in coming to the, to the point of repentance before your God. Most of us, all of us, were slower than we should have been 
in recognizing our sin and recognizing the way we had offended God and recognizing the way we had turned our back on the Savior. But God is not quick to bring judgment. He is slow to bring. Now, he will bring judgment. But he is gracious and he is merciful and he's kind and he is slow to anger. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating here. He's demonstrating the mercy of God. But secondly, he's also showing the love of the Messiah, Messiah rather, for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now theologians have a field day with defining what the world is, but the reality is the world is, no matter how you define it, it's people from every language and nation and tribe and tongue. And you know it because in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus sends out the disciples, some of the very last words he says to them, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Interesting that the gospel progression must go through Samaria. Jerusalem first, that's the city. Judea would have been the country uh, that, Ju that Jerusalem was in. Samaria then would have been far north. And while you're going north, you just keep going to the rest of the world. But it's interesting that the gospel is to be proclaimed in Samaria. And in fact, if you keep reading in Acts, Acts chapter 9, 8, uh, Acts chapter 9, you see that the gospel does go to Samaria. The Samaritans do receive the Holy Spirit. They put their faith in Jesus, the most important one. They, they do trust him. They, they, there are Samaritans that, that by faith enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because Jesus is slow to anger. He is abounding in love and mercy. He wants even Samaritans, those dreaded evil Samaritans, to be saved. And this is what the disciples are learning along the road. Now, you could argue they should have known it. John chapter 4, Jesus spends a whole day talking to a Samaritan woman, and then the Samaritan woman goes and gets the town, and the whole town uh, embraces Jesus as the Messiah. So you should have think they should have figured it out. But they're a little, like you and me, they're a little slow, and instead want to call fire from heaven on the Samaritans, but not Jesus. So Jesus moves on. They learn the lesson of God's forbearance and in the sense then learn the lesson of the compassionate Messiah. Here's the third lesson they learn. They learn what is the greatest priority of a disciple. And this begins with verses 57 and goes to 62. There are actually three people in this verse that are approached by Jesus or approach Jesus. First person in verse 57 a person comes to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. The second person comes to him, uh, or in verse 59, Jesus says to him, follow me. And the third person will come in verse 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. And in each one of these instances, the person uh, puts a particular qualifier to his discipleship, to his following of Jesus. The first one says, well, I'll follow you if I have a nice place to stay and if my needs are accommodated. The second person says, well, I'll follow you if I can bury my father. Verse 59, uh, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And there's some discussion as to whether or not the father was dead and what the man was really asking was to wait until his father died and then he would follow Jesus. Or, um, and more likely, the, the father had died, and the man needed time to bury him and all of that, and Jesus says, well, no. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. And what he means there is let the, those who are spiritually dead bury those who are physically dead. Instead, you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, verse 60. That's a pretty radical thing to say. And the third person who comes to him in verse 61 says, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to those in my home. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow looks back. So the opposite of what you would think, you would think Jesus would want as many followers as possible. Instead, he's actually discouraging them. Far from encouraging them to be disciples, he cautions them. Now, most 
preachers, when they come to this text, will address it as the cost of discipleship. And they will see three different costs here in these three lessons. And this isn't a bad way to understand the text. In verse 58, for example, you see the cost of comfort and convenience. If you want to follow Jesus, you better expect that you're not going to be sleeping in uh, fancy hotels. Other people, uh, the second cost is the cost of our duties or obligations. The, the man who wants his, to bury his father. Um, in the ancient Jewish tradition, perhaps the most sacred thing you could have done would have been to bury your father. I, I mean sacred and the, the, uh, the most how do, serious thing you could have done, let's put it that way, was to, was to bury your father. Or your, or your mother, for that matter, if she had died, that was treated like a sacred honor. And if you look at a lot of the ancient uh, Jewish writings, they would excuse you know, Sabbath observance. They would excuse all kinds of Old Testament laws if you were burying your father, because that was the most important thing you could imagine you could do as a child. And yet here's Jesus coming along saying, yeah, it's important, but it's not that important. It's not as important as following me. And the third cost was the cost of relationships in verse 61. The man simply wants to go back and say goodbye to his family and maybe put his house in order because he followed, all, followed Jesus. All of these things seemed legitimate reasons to delay a person from following Jesus. But if you look at it from the historical perspective, you look at it from Jesus' perspective, what is he doing? Where is he going? He's on the road to Jerusalem. He's going to go to the cross. He has set his face to go to Jerusalem. There's nothing going to stop him. And he doesn't have time to wait around for people to take care of their earthly business while he's on the, he's on, on the road to Jerusalem. He's on a mission. And Jesus is basically saying, look, if you're going to be with me on this mission, then be prepared for the hardships. Be prepared to leave now. And be prepared to pay the price and pay the cost. But I think there's a central lesson actually tying all of these three lessons together. And what Jesus is simply trying to communicate to his disciples, and to everyone else for that matter, that following Jesus must be your highest priority if you're going to be a disciple. It's more important than comfort or convenience. It's more important than duty or tradition, such as burying your father. It's more important than hanging on to past relationships, even if those relationships are close family relationships. Nothing is more important than following Jesus. Jesus will say later on in Luke 14 that if anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And he's simply teaching the lesson here. Now, our lives may include these kinds of things at some level, but they are not what comes first. They are not the main priority. They are not the main objective in, of a disciple. The main objective of a disciple is to follow Jesus wherever he goes and wherever he leads. The disciples are on the road with Jesus. And to be fair to them, many of them are paying the price that Jesus mentions. Many of them have left their family, at least for a time. Many of them have given up some obligations and duties that they had to their communities or to their families, at least for a time. And certainly all of them had given up the comforts of a place to stay and knowing where the next meal was coming from and all the convenience that come from living at home. All of them had, in fact, done that already and were doing that. So this is the question then, and it's the question for them, but it's also the question for us. Is obedience to Christ more important than anything else in our lives? We know who the most important person is. Now, what's the most important thing? Is the most important thing in our lives obedience to Christ? Or is the most important thing in our lives our homes or our possessions? or our relationships, or our friends, or our reputation, or our image. All of these things may, in fact, need to be sacrificed for you to follow Jesus. Many people have given these things up to follow Jesus. Think of countries in the world, 
Well, and we probably all know of people whose family have abandoned them once they decided to become Christians. Certainly this is true in Muslim uh, culture, in the Muslim, in the Muslim culture, if you uh, grow up Muslim and you decide to follow Jesus, guess what your family's gonna do? They're gonna kick you out of the house. If, if you were a wealthy person and you obtained your wealth through unscrupulous, immoral means, what's going to happen when you decide to follow Jesus? You're going to feel awful guilty about that illegal money and illegal wealth. You're going to be like Zacchaeus. You're going to say, God, I'm going to return everything that I stole from anybody. I'm going to repay them back four times what I owe them. Because Jesus, following Jesus is demanding. People have abandoned their, their, their people that they love to follow Jesus because Jesus didn't want them to marry that person or Jesus didn't want them to be associated with that group anymore or Jesus wanted them to forsake that habit or that place that they used to regularly go. There is a cost in following Jesus, but there is because Jesus is the highest priority and obedience to him is more important than anything. So here's the questions we're left with then. And these are the way Jesus is challenging his disciples. Is, first of all, is Jesus the most important thing to us? Secondly, is his compassion and forbearance of others part of our character as well? How do we look at people who insult us? How do we look at the people who give us a hard time? How do we look at the people who fight against our agendas or our moralities or our character? Do we treat them the way Jesus treated the Samaritans? And thirdly, are we willing to give up everything to follow him, even if it means our own lives? Because ultimately, that's what Jesus demands if we want to follow him. Let's pray that God would make us faithful. Lord, this is a hard thing that you have called us to to give up everything to follow you. And yet it is a joyful thing that you have called us to. For in giving up everything, we gain everything for eternity. So Lord, help us to count the cost, but help us also, on the other hand, to see the reward, to see the blessing that comes from knowing the God who loves us, who cares for us, and who will eternally lead us into his kingdom. May we act in faith and obedience, even today, as we dedicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.